It now is under the um, jurisdiction of Egypt, but only recently. Um, and um, it's run by or occupied by about 12 different Bedouin tribes um, in the north and in the south. It's, 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 uh, Egyptians have two governments there, South Sinai and North Sinai. In the north, there, there is a border with Gaza. Some of the northern Bedouin tribes are linked to the, the tribes that you, that, that you find in Palestine and Jordan. So the borders there between Sinai and, and, um, and Palestine, Gaza, are, as we know, artificial borders. And as a result, the Bedouins are being split up between those two countries. We know a lot about e Egypt's uh, policy on human rights, or lack of them, mm -hmm. uh, often covered on uh, press TV, actually. But uh, I understand it's not just uh, the Gaza border they're causing <coughs> trouble over. No, I mean, the problem is, in Sinai, is that um, the Bedouins feel very much as if they've been marginalized by the Egyptian government. The Egyptian government are, in effect, um, occupying Sinai as a military zone, which means that the Bedouin are being uh, are suffering from discrimination. Um, they're being arrested at checkpoints because the Egyptian government are suspicious of them. They're suspicious of their motives. They're suspicious that they aren't uh, settled because Egypt or Cairo has always been a very settled agrarian economy. And so they're very suspicious of a people that they can't control. Are they or treated a bit like the Romanies in Europe? I would say so. It's, it's very similar. They're treated, I mean, we tend to romanticize the Bedouin. And certain countries like Saudi and um, Libya, uh, if you think of Gaddafi with his Bedouin tent, they appreciate the Bedouin. But other countries, like Egypt, they really treat them as, as, as we would say, gypsies in a pejorative sense. Um, I know that one mayor of Sham described the, the Bedouin as vermin. And that's the way they see them. So there's been a vacuum, um, a political vacuum there. The Egyptian government are interested in the Bedouin now because it's a politically sensitive area. Because there were, there were terrorist attacks in um, some of the tourist resorts, Sham, Dahab, um, Taba, between 2004 and 2006. So now the military have cracked down on Sinai and have blamed the Bedouin for the problems there. And of course, tourism is the main, or one of the main rev revenues of the Egyptian economy. So they really want to make sure that you know, Everyone's thinking about happen. the succession, of course, in, in Cairo, in, in Egypt. But uh, who's campaigning on uh, behalf of these uh, Bedouins then? Um, and is there any change uh, in uh, store if there actually was a change in government in Egypt? I don't know. I think they do realize that the problems of the, that the political vacuum up until now, um, which they're reacting against by occupying, um, have been exacerbated by the fact that they've been neglected. So what they're trying to do now, I think they have realized that they need to, well, consider the Bedouin, or the Bedou, as, um, well, to give them value and, and, and give them the resources and um, some of the means to create their lives, to create wealth for themselves that they haven't had before. But I wouldn't say that there are very big moves in that direction because there's so much political suspicion of the Bedouin. So what it tends to take is outside um, organizations, NGOs, who come in and work with the Bedouin to to try well, I know you took lots of photos, so we're going to link uh, from uh, our website to yours if uh, yeah. people at home want to watch mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. and look I at look some of those photos. That, yeah. the okay. Thank you very much, Kay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> our thoughts are naturally with all of those who lost their loved ones last week and for all of the martyrs of Palestine. And we should also spare a thought for this person, Holocaust survivor Hedy Epstein, who uh, has failed in her fourth attempt to get to the Gaza Strip. After the war, Hedy married and launched into her new life in America and tried to leave behind her tragic past. Until news of a new human tragedy began to unfold thousands of miles away. In 1982, I got what you might call a wake-up call. I heard about the massacres in the two refugee camps of Zapra and Shatila, located in Lebanon. And I needed to find out what was that all about? Who was responsible for this? What was driving you to find out more about Sabra and Shatila? Well, Were you politically I just, active? I, I just heard, and I don't remember how I heard, probably read something or and I don't remember how I heard about it. It was just something that a horrible incident that happened. And so I wonder, what is this all about? You know, and also what happened between 1948 
1982 when I paid little or no attention to this part of the world. And as I learned more and understood more, I became increasingly more horrified by the policies and practices of the Israeli government and the Israeli military. And as I learned more and understood more, I began to speak out publicly against those policies and practices. To everyone's amazement, the Holocaust survivor embraced the Palestinian struggle with a passion and even went to witness for herself their suffering and resistance. By 2003, I was in the West Bank for the first time. I've been in the West Bank five times, all told, since then. Well, those were the thoughts of Hedy Epstein, who was recounting her story for us in a forthcoming TV documentary about her work for Palestine. Well, if you want to know more about today's guests, go on to our website, www.retanceandridley.com. And uh, don't forget, we're on Twitter and Facebook. See you all next week. <laughs>